Let's bow our heads for a moment. Our Lord and Father, we ask you, as you have promised to be in this place, we thank you that Jesus came to help us see you more clearly. And Holy Spirit, you are here even now, willing, if we will let you, to have Christ live in us, in the middle of us. And as we look at rescue, recovery, and renewal, we ask you to show us in Scripture and in our lives this time what recovery and renewal is about. We ask you to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes in life, you're rolling along and something very surprising happens. This is someone's dash cam. And if you look there to the left, there's a surprise coming. I call it chaos. Imagine being in, that's a car, by the way. Imagine you're in that car right now. I would tell you right now, you're fine. It's all good so far. As we drive a little farther, now you're, if you weren't scared already, you're going to be scared now. Right? Hopefully you have your seatbelt on. We don't know about that either, do we? But this is, this is chaos here. This is a bad moment about to happen. And then your car, you end up right here. Now imagine we're the people in this car. We've seen this happen. We came to a stop. And the question is, what should we do now? Us, the people in the car, the picture was taken from. What do you think the first thing we should do? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good. I think that's step number two. I want step number one, but that's a good next step. You're one ahead of me. What do you think? What do you say? That's right. That's right. Let's call for some rescuers. Right? What's that number? 911, not 911. There's no 11 on your phone. 911. That's the old fireman's story I used to tell over and over and over. That's right, that's the first thing we should do. And now, Miss Smarty Pants Jukes, who stole my thunder already after we did step one, she's always ahead of us. She's always ahead of the rest of us. The next thing to do after we start rescue and call for help is to help the people as you're trained to do. You shouldn't do more than you should. I mean, Dave's story sort of told us about that, right? He tried to do a little more than he should, and he became another victim. So that wasn't super helpful. He turned one rescue into two. Trust me, that's the fear of every firefighter at work or elsewhere is to try and not turn the one rescue into two. Right then, he's just like, oh, when he stepped on that left foot, he just, I'm right there with you. He's just like, oh, no. I burned my hands one time. It's like, oops, I've created another call. That's not good. So you should render help. And I think that's very wise and very right. Um, I wouldn't tell you exactly what that is, because I think it depends on your training. You could make things worse. You could find yourself making the problem worse. So it's as you're trained. If you have a first aid kit, you know how to do first aid, that would be good. Maybe in this particular case, you might want to bring a fire extinguisher because sometimes upside down cars leak. They don't leak upside, right side up, but this one's upside down. So that might be what you do. And then, hopefully quickly, the kids come and take over. 
and start doing the rest of the rescue. And they bring a box full of tools and close the street and uh, help get the people out of the car and make sure there's lots of rescue equipment. They come and help us. And then you don't really have a job to do. But I, I want to stop for a moment and imagine this. I, I want to back up a step and ask this question. Because we have this wreck and all, and we brought the rest. But my, my real question, and none of you asked it, is should we help them? What? How many people, raise your hand if you think we should help them? Uh oh. Well, some didn't raise their hand. All right, I'm with you over here. He was adjusting his shirt so he didn't raise his hand. Who thinks we shouldn't help them? Well, that's nobody. Okay, um, what if the accident was all their fault? What if they did that on purpose? Should we help them? You're still with that. What if they were being mean and trying to hurt someone and did that to the car? Should we help them? Okay, everybody's there. Hmm, that's interesting. And quite frankly, friends, in a discussion here, I would tell you, we're going to take this in a biblical direction. This isn't just an interesting story. But often when chaos happens, what is the church word that we use for chaos? Does anyone want to guess? The church word might be sin, when we are making a mistake, when we're messing up, when we're not doing something right, then bad things start to happen to us. That word we use here is not chaos, but sin. And yet all of you think when people do this, regardless of the reason why, whether it was an accident or on purpose or done with evil intention, you all said we should help them. And that is the right answer, folks. That is the answer from the heart of Jesus, that we should not judge others. This is it in action, in a world that we can really understand. When people have screwed up, when they have committed sin, our role here is to help them on a path of recovery and renewal. Just like in this wreck, which you know instinctively, the exact only right answer is to go help them. It isn't why they got into trouble. We don't care about that at all. Now, if they did this car wreck three years ago, do you think they should do it again? Right? They shouldn't do that again, right? That's the part where we talk about not sinning over and over because they're going to have another bad crash. But our role in sin is to help people recover from that, not to tell them they shouldn't get help. And sometimes you hear that, friends. Sometimes you hear people saying we shouldn't be helping them, and I don't think that makes good sense to me. But then the next question is, and this is where Dave really took us great with his story, is that when they're part of the injury, the victim, he joined the victimhood, but whoever that is, and I pick on him because he gave us a good example of it, does he then go back to being a rescuer? Did he go back to being a rescuer? No, he got fired. He got fired, and his buddy rescued him. And that is discernment, because David, uh, Dave started in that story as a rescuer. But once he became a victim, he couldn't stay as a rescuer. He has to be, work his way through the rescue and recovery process. And he wasn't happy about it. Believe me, I'm with you there, my friend. Um, and he was a little embarrassed, and I'm brave of him to tell us about it because it's a little embarrassing. But this is happening to all of us, by the way. And when you're in that state, like last year when mom died, I wasn't much of a rescuer for a while. I needed you to love me and to help me restore and recover. And that is discernment. That's where we look at people covered in sin or mistakes and help them and realize they shouldn't be working right now. We should be caring for them. 
That's one example of the difference between judgment and discernment. Judgment is about us trying to decide who deserves help. Discernment is about us saying, you shouldn't be helping right now. You get a health day. You get a break today. It's all right that we carry you today. And believe me, like many rescuers, he was not happy about that. He did not want that to happen. But that happens. And all of you, as we talk a little bit more about this, understand that sometimes I'm talking to you as a helper. And sometimes I'm going to be talking to you as a person getting help from us. And you should not be embarrassed about that. That's what we're here for, is to teach you how to be helpful, to have you be part of the helping part. And when you're not having a good day, you should be able to be okay if we take care of you. Don't be embarrassed. We want to take care of you. You get your day too. It's not only one little thing. You get to have a break. But rescue's not done. Once the firefighters and the police fire come help, the person's not actually still rescued. They've got to get a ride to the hospital. And that part, I call that the wilderness. Because the people that work the scene, and that's where most of my experience was, was getting people out of the car and into the ambulance. Sometimes I drove the ambulance too. But once you get in the ambulance, the rescue isn't really over. The outside rescue is over. Them being stuck in the car is over. They no longer need to be rescued. Getting off the cliff, you're not needing to be rescued. But getting from the point of danger to where recovery actually begins, which is the hospital, you're still being rescued. You're just being rescued on the inside because what injured you on the inside, we do not fix. The paramedics and the nurses that help in the helicopters, which also a job Mr. Crusoe did for years before he was in the fire service, they don't actually mend you or fix you either. They're just getting you to the doctor. That ride is still part of the rescue, even though you're fairly safe in the ambulance or the helicopter. And that leads us to where recovery begins. And this is where the doctors here in our church and a lot of the nurses that help in that, they begin to help you recover. They actually start mending you. They start closing holes that you've had and plug you all up. They call that surgery and they use big words but that's a basically what a doctor's doing, is plugging up all the holes that you got. They don't even actually mend you, by the way. They put everything together, but the healing is actually still being done by God. They, I mean, I don't mean disrespect, because they have a very important role in getting you put back together, Humpty Dumpties. But God does the actual mending of the skin piece to piece. They just get it really close. Very important job, but they don't actually make your skin stick together. They tie it close, but it is God that does the mending. So there's more work being done in recovery. And then we go to from recovery to renewal. And again, this is nurses and aides and other people that after you're put together, that you've got to begin the process of getting back to where you were. And that includes people like Julie and Lisa in our church that help you take your parts that are mending and get you back to full function. That's the renewal part. That's everything that happens from that car crash floating around fine to going back to whatever your new life looks like. Recovery to renewal. And sometimes you end up with some version of a new beginning. That you can't do everything exactly as you did before. Or that there's some new accommodation. That your life isn't completely as it was. That's the little road. Now that I bring this out though, in these steps in an accident, which is 
the world I came from in the fire service and the ambulance business, how does this really make any sense in a Bible discussion? But we already have this story in the Bible. It's covered at the end of Genesis and the first few chapters of Exodus and in Deuteronomy that these steps happen, the chaos, the rescue, getting a ride, recovery, and renewal. That's what happens to the victim. The roles that help that happen are roles of one, prevention, which is what we preach about avoiding sin or avoiding crashing your car, which is always good advice. And then serving in rescues, helping people be rescued. Sometimes it involves training, learning how to do those things, and then caring for people and supporting people. And those are the steps that you saw happening in the slideshow before this talk began. It was showing you this training in the uh, classes that Susan Excel's doing, how to make things and create things. The opportunity for us to train together and find out what each other are like at the gatherings. And the ch acts of service that happen in the ark and in the community services that happen in the coffee thing outside, that happens in the way the church is cared for and the way you are cared for. Those are all elements of this process happening. And in the Bible, it looks like this. Chaos is Egypt. It's the place where you're in a very difficult place and you need to be rescued. In the time in scripture time, in Bible time, Egypt was people enslaved. They had no chance of getting out. They had been slaves for 400 years. Your dad is making bricks. You're making bricks. And your son is going to be making bricks. That's what's going to happen. And yet, a guy named Moses talks to God and God says, we're not going to make bricks no more. We're going to go do something else. And God leads them from slavery to Jordan to die. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Pharaoh was coming to get them. And he opened the water and they went on through. And the water closed behind them. And once they got on the other side, they were basically rescued. And as Brian said today in the class, just a couple more weeks, they get to go home, hang out in Canaan. But when they got there, they decided, oh, no, no, the people are too big for us. We're going to get hurt over there. And so they had to ride around in circles with a bad GPS unit for 40 years while they were trained on the inside, while they got fixed on the inside, and the relationship with God, and how he was to lead their lives, and how he was to help them, so that when they went back to the land of the really big people, they weren't scared anymore, because they knew God was telling them where to go, and that God was going to work through them to send them home. And then they formed the judges period that God had given for them in the new place. It took a long time. But for each of us, we can be in any one of these positions in our lives right now. You can fall in and out of these positions. Some days you can be a rescuer, and some days you can be having chaos. You can fall in any one of these positions. But the path and the journey that God will carry you through the steps that God will carry you through, and God will send people from this building to help you go through this process. We're committed to that for you. But some of you aren't participating, you're just watching. And we want to invite you to get training and to join in that process. That is something for you to consider if you're not with us doing things already, that there's a place for you in this process if you're not in the middle of being rescued right now. And if you've been rescued and then think that's it, I'm suggesting that there's few more things in that journey to renewal. It's not just about getting rescued. So how does this work in real life? 
couple weeks back. Everybody's very happy studying, playing, and doing chores. And then the teachers start talking about something called finals, Mrs. Caruso. And the rest of your minions. And the look of high schoolers' face especially. I mean, it happens a little bit in elementary school. But in high school, there's this look they get in that last few weeks before finals. And the, the level of terror that increases in everyone as they prepare for whatever fun. That's the chaos in their little happy world that's being a coming to them and occurring to them. And so then they go back to studying even more. Some of the studying that the teachers recommended four months ago, and then three months ago, and then two months ago while they were busy playing. Now they have to catch that studying up. So I don't blame the teachers all for that chaos because they didn't, they didn't prepare, right? But then they cram for those finals, especially the last weekend. And I don't get that. From the world I come from, you study as you go. When I went to college, if I found out what I was taking, I'd buy the books a couple months ahead and read them before the first day of class. I know I'm weird. But they get through those finals, and when they pass, it's vacation. This is, again, the biblical model. This is what God's calling all of us to do in various versions. Here's how it's happening here. We have people in community and around us and in this building that are having chaos and tough days. Nikki's having some for her. Outside, we see them in our service communities people having chaos. And a lot of those people, not Nikki, but a lot of those people don't know who God is. They're in that chaos on their own. They're alone and they are in need of friends. And part of our first introduction is to let them know that we know God. We, the people here. And as we meet them, as you come to Acts or come for treatment, often we'll offer to pray with you and to get you connected with a God that we know. And then, after we get a chance to sort of connect with them, then we're going to help them with these services that we have. And for some people, and we've had people, and they sit in these pews now, that came to this place through our service programs and are now members here, working out there, doing service to other people. That's the journey they're taking, and we agree with that. And we take this training and we put it to action. And that's what the slideshow was, our church in action. And so that, and we talk about this, and we prayed about that this morning, that Christ will come. Hopefully he will come this year. But I want to tell you, Christ is already here. He said the kingdom will come now. That was radical about Jesus' message. Isn't a promise that the next David would come again, which is true. But there was also a now component to it as well. That you can have Christ living in your life right now, dwelling in you right now. That you know in an assurance in you, inside of you for certain, you know what's coming for you no matter what's ahead of you. That you and Jesus are connected and joining and going in the same direction and in the same place. And that I would invite you is what our role is happening here. And so you can look on this line and sort of look at where you are now and see where we want to help you go and want you to help us help others go in this direction that are based on the stories that we read in Exodus. And quite frankly, this model, Jesus, who came here as God, who lived as a human, which is completely unique to our beliefs. There is no other God out there that said, I'm going to stop being a God and I'm going to just be a person. I'm still God, but I'm not going to use any godliness. I'm just going to be one of you. And I'm going to suffer like you. I'm going to struggle like you. Even when Lazarus was dead, Jesus said he would raise him. He says that. I'm going to raise him. He knows what's going to happen. But when he meets Mary and Martha, what happened 
to God. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, friends. He wept. And he already knew that there was a good outcome. But he was filled with compassion and our suffering and our sorrow. And he felt that loss of Lazarus even though he knew the resurrection was coming. And that happens here in this church from time to time when we have someone go asleep. That we all feel that loss even as we cling to the hope of the resurrection. And Jesus felt that as we do. And this is just one of many verses of what God is focused and what he is like. He said, many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts are toward us. And this thoughts toward us brings to mind another verse in Jeremiah 29, 11, that those thoughts are good and plans for good help. What you have done in your thoughts toward us, that there are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. We're not a place telling you that you have to obey God or he will kill you. We're not that place. We don't preach hell here because that makes no sense to us. My ears you have opened. Your loving kindness, your truth continually preserves me. Yet the Lord thinks on me. You are my help and my deliverer. There are verse after verse of this. Jeremiah in Psalms in Isaiah in the life of Jesus, that God's point is to take care of you, to rescue you, and to take you from a place of pain to a place of recovery, and to give you people who agree with that idea to help you along that journey. So the questions boil down to this. These questions may only one apply to you, or the other apply to you, or quite frankly, friends, they may both apply to you. But in this next year, to help us get through chaos to recovery and renewal, the question is, will you be God's hand and heart in reaching people in chaos? And whatever version of label of sin you want to say, or whatever reason they've been hurt, whether it's their fault, somebody else's fault, something happened to them, whatever it is, are you a role in showing them the compassion and the loving heart of a God who's here to help people to recovery and renewal. Will you be that? Or the other question is, if you're the person in struggle and alone and naked and struggling and you've tried everything else. I mean, we could go to the library and see a thousand self-help books, friends, and that isn't the answer. But will you let God, let God restore and renew you in the next year? That's the questions for me, for you. Not to make promises of what you should be doing, because that's typically what people tell you. Next year, I should, and we make this list. And by the middle of January, we can talk about the sermon of failure. Because everything that we put on our promises of should did not happen. It is only through God dwelling in you and surrounding yourself with people that can help you know what that God is like that you have a chance of renewal and recovery. That we may touch you, we may connect with you, may know you and talk to you and give you encouragement and give you support. And maybe we'll feed you. Maybe we'll just sit with you. Maybe in a year we'll bring you a gift basket like they did a year after mom died. They came by, the Nicholas, and brought Sandy another basket on the anniversary of mom's passing, just to say we remember also that mom passed. You're not alone. Your mother hasn't forgotten you. Your mother's friends remember you, daughter, and you are loved by us. It's been a year. We remember it's been a year. 
That's how God wants to touch us and reach us, is one-on-one with each one of us, taking the place of what Jesus was doing. Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit could fill us to be that next connection. All right, everyone, I'm going to ask you to do something weird. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm not going to look either. But I'm going to ask you about these two questions. Let's close our eyes. I'm going to look the other way, so there's no cheating on my part, and ask you to close your eyes, and this is between you and God and nobody else, but you can decide for yourselves right now You can raise your hand for this. You can just raise it a little high if you're shy. Will you be God's hand and heart in 24 without judgment of those that need it? This is your commitment. No one's counting. We're not keeping score. But this is a decision for you to make. But you could, this year, touch someone else with the love of Jesus and the hand and heart of God. All right, we'll put your hands down, and we'll go to the second question, and some of you may answer both of these questions. Some of you may only answer this one. Some of you may not answer either, and that's okay, too. The second question is, will you let God restore and renew you in 2024 without you resisting him? Or you'll resist him less, I suppose. And you'll try to let him take care of you through his spirit, through his people, through his word, through his songs, through his activities. If that's for you, you can raise your hand a little or a lot. All right, you can put your hands down, everybody. No one to be embarrassed. I didn't peek at all. But that's what I hope for all of us. And I think for many of us, we will find ourselves on both questions, at least for me personally. I will find myself dealing with both those questions in the years to come until Jesus returns. Thank you. Our loving Father, we thank you so much. Help us, help us know how much you love us. Help us understand that the God of the Old Testament is probably a bit misrepresented by people who really meant well. But he looks like Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything that we truly know about God was not from the days that we saw through the glass darkly, but from the days that God walked among us, that Emmanuel, that he dwelled with us. And that Emmanuel promises that for each of us, the Holy Spirit is now here because he left to leave room for that so that each, every individual of the 8 billion people on this planet could meet this God of the infinite universe and have him live inside them. A God who knows what it is to cry about death, even as he already knew the hope and guarantee of the resurrection. And we ask you to give us courage to be able to reach out and help those around us with kindness and love and no judgment, And we ask you, if we are struggling with something, that you give us the courage and trust to open our hearts up to let you move us, to let you carry us, that you will pick us up on your shoulders and you will carry us. There's not two footprints in the sand, there's one. And it's Jesus picking you up through your trouble and carrying you to the other side to where you can be renewed and restored. I ask this on behalf of all of us in the year to come, that we may be blessed by you and that we may bless you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.